when I was in my early 30s, I didn't have kids. I lived in Manhattan, Illinois, and my wife, Dawn, worked at a restaurant. And frequently on Sunday mornings, she had to open. So she would be gone at like 9 a.m. or somewhere around there. I would go outside when I woke up and grab the Sunday Chicago Tribune, which was about three inches thick with news and advertisements, and most importantly, the Sunday comics. This is Third Song In with Chris Derrickson and Tom Polachek. I would grab that paper, I'd jump in the car, I would drive about 10, 15 minutes away to a little Mexican restaurant that served breakfast, and I would spend an hour reading the Sunday paper and save the comics until the very end so I could go through all of my favorite comic strips. Now, the Sunday Chicago Tribune is about, I don't know, a quarter inch thick. Uh, Nobody buys the hard copy of it, and there are barely any comics left. People don't know what they're missing. I mean, I I didn't quite have the same ritual as you, but I remember Sundays especially uh, reading through, you know, it's obviously a much bigger version, or at least used to be, read through all the other parts, even though the comics is what I wanted to read first. I'd read through everything else, set the comics to the side, get rid of the rest of the paper, and just sit down and savor those color, you know, the longer color printed comics on Sunday. And it was just, you know, it didn't take all that long, but, you know, there'd probably be 20 or 30 strips uh, in a Sunday one. And they're all, you know, six to eight panels for the, you know, the ones with stories. And then, of course, you'd have the single panel ones. Um, and it was just a, it was just a joy. It was, talk about escapism. I mean, that's what it was. You're just into this world of usually meaningless, funny, nothingness. And shit was funny. Some of it was a little more meaningful, but certainly at least a little smarter. You know, we when we were in college together and, and after for the next four or five years was to me kind of the golden age of, of newspaper comics because uh, the far side was still out at that point. Calvin and Hobbes was still out. Bloom County, we used to read religiously. And Doonesbury, which I think, I think actually Doonesbury is still in the comics. It's like one of the five that are left at this point. Uh, but there was also Life in Hell with Matt Groening, which wasn't necessarily in the Tribune, but I remember we used to read that comic strip. And I think in St. Louis, it was in the Riverfront Times. It was in, you know, the Free Weekly is where you yeah. would find that stuff. So it was kind of a different thing. But it's just amazing how... I mean, there was there was a lot of news in the comics as far as I was concerned. There's a lot of political comic, you know, there were a lot of political comics and and uh, but it just seemed like there were so many talented. There were so many talented people that were doing comics, Sunday comic strips at that point. And I I think those people, you know, the newest version of those people now are all online. I think it's all web comics. And and I think there's some great web comics, by the way, uh, that. I don't, I don't read on the web, but you know, eventually they'll make it around to like a hard copy, a printed version. And I've, I've uh, read a few comics that are yeah, that started completely online and uh, eventually made their way to to print in one form or another. Yeah, and I hadn't done it in a while, but in prep for this, I you know, went and looked back at some comic books, like you know, collections of comic strips, and. Now, I mean, you can, it's almost as good as the streaming services. Like you can read the comic from today and then there's an option to read every every comic from the beginning of the series, which is just awesome. So the last 24 hours I've been reading comic strips uh, that I'd long since forgotten about. So <laughs> I know what I'm going to be doing over the next couple of weeks. Yeah, I have a couple collections uh, like I've got a Farside collection. I have a ton of Calvin and Calvin and Hobbes collections, including he they put out a huge hardcover box set. It probably is 15 or 20 years ago now that it came out, but every once in a while, I'll, you know, they're in like a cardboard sleeve. It's really yeah. fancy looking, and you know, it, it weighs about 15 pounds. 
And every once in a while, I pull that out. And man, talk about a, uh, a comic strip that holds up. Calvin and Hobbes was just, it was just art, you know, and, and uh, I'm glad that I have those collected versions of it. Yeah, I have the same thing. That's the only thing that I will be able to pass on to whoever. <laughs> Here's 25 bucks in the Calvin and Hobbes collection. <laughs> guessing my kids will fight over the Calvin and Hobbes question. So. Yeah, you, could, it, you know, and when I go like, in our, I've got a bookshelf down in the basement. It's just kind of books that I, I don't have the heart to give away or get rid of. And, and I have three or four Bloom County collections. And it's funny when my, when uh, one of my boys was little, he discovered uh, peanuts at Charlie Brown. And for and it was only a short period of time, but he actually he wanted to look for collections of old Peanuts comics. And and there are some cool hardcover collections of Charles Schultz's Peanuts, which started like in 1950 uh, and lasted 50 years in the in the newspapers. Uh, so we have a couple of those collections, too. And I was never a big Peanuts or Charlie Brown fan myself. Uh, but uh, my son Jake, he really got into it for a year or two where he was always reading through that stuff, which I thought was kind of cool. Yeah, I mean, I look back at uh, Peanuts just as one that changed the genre, um, but it never overly entertained me. And then I think Calvin and Hobbes took it to a whole nother level. But yeah, I mean, I think that's the thing. I mean, we can sit here and talk through some of the best comic strips, quote unquote, over, over time. Um, but so much when we were prepping for this episode to me it was all about the experience like that that idea of opening up the paper and for calvin and Hobbes, like i looked forward to that uh, strip as much as anything else like you would you couldn't wait to see you know what the joke was especially on sunday because he'd have often those uh imaginary ones where he'd either be out in space a spaceman spiff or you know the dinosaur and just the beauty of that, of his artwork, no one else is doing that at the time. And I'm not sure anyone's ever come as close as what Watterson did. It was a shame. I, I distinctly remember knowing when the last strip was going to run and reading it, you know, quote unquote live. I mean, I, you know, got that paper and I saved it. And uh, even though I have the entire collection in that big ass, you know, cardboard box, that was a, that was like, we talked about with our uh, TV shows, like you connect with the characters and yep. it was, it was a moment. It was, it was hard to let Calvin go. Yeah, it and had, it really did have a finale too. The, the very yeah. final strip was just, was heartbreaking. And, uh, and I don't know if you've seen, and, and I think this came about in a webcomic version, but somebody drew has drawn a couple strips that are supposed to be Calvin grown up with his own little daughter, whose name is Susie, which of course was his arch enemy when he was a kid. And, uh, and he gives her his tiger. Uh, and I don't think any of it was authorized uh, by uh, Watterson, but of course he never licensed any of his stuff either. So people can kind right. of run uh, rampant with it. And the thing I saw was actually pretty good. And, and I felt was really true to, you know, the spirit of, of the original Calvin and Hobbes, but it also practically made me burst out in tears. So it's, it just goes to show you how, like you said, you get so invested in, in, you know, the funny papers. It's just wild that it would be that important. Yeah. I saw one similar and maybe we're referring to the same one where Calvin was an old man um, and was dying and he had a grandson who was a troublemaker um, and he gave him Hobbes and yeah, that, that, there's that moment of passing it on. And that one really close. I mean, made me really close to tears because Susie was his wife. Um, right. Yeah. I saw that she one too. Buys, yeah. That was, that, and again, not authorized or anything, but I think most of those have been done. You know, you get the annoying ass, uh, stickers on the back of trucks where calvin's peeing on something right calvin pissing is uh, ubiquitous yes. or was it's not so much yeah. these days but right it, but <laughs> those were there truly i think paying homage to the original yeah it's pretty cool yeah and apparently there are some some uh and i won't even call them current anymore but there were some um comic strip creators that occasionally in their strips after calvin and Hobbes was gone after he stopped doing it 
they would throw little homages and little, you know, little references to Calvin Hobbes. You can tell just how important he was to the, the next generation of, of artists. So I was, I mentioned briefly um, some web comics and, and I guess now that I think about it, maybe this should have been some form of a recommendation, but it kind of falls in the cracks, I think. But I don't even remember how I got turned on to it, but if, if you get a chance, you can find a, a, there's it was a web comic and now it comes out in um, in soft cover version. I think there are like eight volumes of a comic called Sam and Fuzzy, which is mm. so hard to describe because it it started out as just kind of this weird little mystery about a, a, a bear and a, and a guy who's kind of a loser. And it turns out the bear has amnesia and, and had a whole new or a whole different life before uh, Sam discovered him. And it turns into a discovery of this like underground, almost, um, uh, well, it's a very surreal world that, that people on the surface don't know about, humans don't know about. That's all these crazy beasts and monsters. And I don't know, it, I, I'm doing a horrible job describing it, but take a look for Sam and Fuzzy. That was a great web comic. And then my daughter introduced me to a comic uh, called Check, Please which was written by a girl who I think was at NYU when she started it. It's about a, a kid who is a division one hockey player in college uh, who happens to be gay. And there are four series of it, I guess. They're basically based upon uh, the four years of college, freshman through senior. And he starts out as a freshman uh, trying to make the team and ends up, you know, the finals without any further spoilers in the, in the fourth one, he's the captain of the team. And it's, it's just really well done and really well drawn. It's kind of, you know, it's very cartoony. It's not realistically drawn at all, in my opinion, but the, the, uh, the woman who created it is just, she's got a, a cool art style. Uh, but the story itself is uh, very, you know, what we were talking about, when we were talking about uh, prestige TV is very literary. You're following these characters as they develop for over four years of college. So uh, that's another one I would recommend highly in terms of new stuff is uh, Check, Please. So you came up with a list of the greatest supposed, you know, comic strips ever. Do you want to work our way through that? I mean, we've talked about Life, is hell, life in Hell. Um, some of those, I think, are a little before our time even as old as we are prince valiant i don't think i ever read i saw that was one i didn't skip a lot of comics but i didn't read any of the serious ones yeah that's actually why i had that on the list because there was a, a list of top 100 online i found and i just kind of went through i didn't i didn't put them all on our list for the outline but i put prince valiant i put uh dick tracy i put pogo because i remember those strips especially when i was younger and those were the ones I did skip. Like I just always yeah. found them to be so uh, so boring. There were a couple others. Most of them were more kind of realistically drawn, I would say. Uh, and uh, what was it there was Martha? There was something Martha. It was like a soap opera. It was just... oh yeah yeah yeah. It was terrible. <laughs> oh no, Mar Mary Worth is what it was called. Mary, Mary Worth. Worth. Yeah. Yes, Mar yes. Like you skip right over Prince Valiant. You skip right over Mary Worth. There were a couple like that that I just. <laughs> That's why I put them on the list is because they may be considered amongst the, the top hundred, but man, I never, I barely read a word of those. Yeah. And I'm the same. Like I said, I didn't skip many, but there were ones and every once in a while I'd be like, yeah, should I really skip these? And I'd read a panel or two and I'm like, yep, I'm going to keep skipping it. Yeah. Just there's a reason you were skipping it. One that um, was on the list that, that is fairly top of everybody's list is Pogo by Walt yes. Kelly. Now yeah. that is one I skipped and Having read about it since then, I think I skipped it because I didn't understand it and that I was too young and too dumb to get what was going on. Because apparently <laughs> that was a really groundbreaking strip and probably worth going back and reading because it was it was a bit like the Doonesbury's. It was a bit like it was a definite strip that was full of social commentary and I it went right over my head when I was little. And uh, that stopped in 1975. So I don't think I would, since I don't think I was mature enough to understand that stuff until roughly last week, I missed all of that. <laughs> I tried reading that in the same way. So don't feel dumb because I don't think I'm <laughs> too late. I don't think I'm completely, I don't think I'm completely dumb. Well, usually I tell you you're dumb, but in this case, I tried a couple of times and I'd read the same stuff, you know, 
because I was always looking for the next, you know, great comic. Because I mean, even though a lot of these have had you know twenty plus year runs, they seem to be even before the newspaper world was turned upside down with all the digital stuff. Um, you know, some of those comics would fade out and you'd have to look for something else. And we'd already read through the Calvin and Hobbes collection a thousand times, probably all the multiple Doonesbury ones and everything else. And, you know, one of my recommendations is about something that's probably a knockoff uh, for sure, but it was one of the better ones that I've seen. So yeah, yeah. this is more of a personal one. I, I had to look them up, but some of them like uh, you got, consider these all sorted together. So you got zits. Um, which is more about the the high school kid. Um, right. And that was done by Jerry Scott, who I think also did Baby Blues. Um, oh, I didn't know that, that one. Jerry, Jerry Scott and Rick Kirkman did Baby Blues. Oh. And then he's not listed, but the reason I was so into Zitz was, and this is another art form that we could talk about at some other time. Uh, Jim Borgman uh, was the political cartoonist for the Cincinnati Inquirer. So when I was growing up, that's the newspaper I read. He was one of the co-authors or uh, artists for Zitz. Um, so I was excited to read his stuff. And he's done some really great stuff. Uh, Cincinnati Bengals. And he, he was a very talented political cartoonist or cultural cartoonist, whatever you want to call it. So that's the other thing I would encourage folks to check out is you know any of these artists who've made their way in the political world too as cartoonists. So it, this but, was yeah. one of those that I remember reading regularly. Like it, you know, yep. you go down through the you go down the page and of course Peanuts was always at the top of every page. Yeah, you know, there were a couple I the, I skipped, like I said, the Prince Valiants and then <laughs> the Mary Worse. Uh but Zitz was the one that I always thought was really funny and and created characters that you actually you know, they developed at least slightly as you went through. I think the main character got a little bit older and a little bit, you know, into, into different relationships and that kind of stuff. So it was always fun to see what was going on. I didn't recommend it. It's not on your list. I, I think it's one of the 100 best, but uh, Pearls Before Swine yes. um, is a fantastic one. That's one you and I were just talking this past week. We both saw, it's rare in a week that we both see a the same movie, let alone that I see a movie at all. But we both saw uh, the new the Wolverine and right. what's his face Deadpool. Deadpool, you know, when we were talking about you know breaking the fourth wall, and Pearls Before Swine does that too because the artist draws himself in the comic all the time, talking to his characters. But the reason I bring it up is on your list, which is deserved, is Family Circus, which <laughs> I thought was just one of the worst. I it was horrible. <laughs> it was horrible. <laughs> It was too sweet and all that other stuff. But Pearls Before Swine makes fun of Family Circus. I think it's uh, understood. I think he might be buddies with the artist. Like he's had some of the characters in there, like older, like with, you know, I don't know if it's Billy or whatever the guy's name was, you know, smoking and just like a total, totally a not in the spirit of what Family Circus was, which was all sweet. And then he'll do that stuff with the, uh, like, uh, you know, show all the places that they ran. He'll make fun of that. And, that's um, I was gonna say. I skipped that every Sunday, except if I saw a little dash lines because yeah. I wanted to see where <laughs> Jeffy was going and how he was Jeffy, fucking with people. That was his name. Yeah, Jeffy. That was his name. I was like, "What's Jeffy fucking with now?" <laughs> and it was the yeah, only time I, I'd ever read it. You could see if there were dotted lines. You're like, "All right, let's see where he's going." And I think that's the thing is, uh, even though the uh, author illustrator for Pearls Before Swine is making fun of that. I think they're a tight community and yeah, they right. sort of, they understand. Um, and he'd always make fun of the fact that family circus fans would like send him hate mail after he'd do that stuff, um, <laughs> which I thought was funny, but I, I have to think that he, he went out and got the blessing of uh, Bill Keen for his spoofs on family circus. So. Yeah, I agree with you. It seemed to me you would see, you every once in a while you'd read down through a, a Sunday page or or even the you know the weekly the black and white uh, strips and it would seem like they were all referencing the same thing at the same time like I think they yep. would collude every once in a while particularly on the anniversaries of something you know some creators work or what have you it did seem like it was a pretty pretty tight group and then the only other one that I I mean Dunesbury we've mentioned is a great one so there's two others I was going to mention briefly. The Far Side, and just because it was the same way, you couldn't wait to read it. It was always a single panel. 
And to this day, we talked this past week, there are ones that are in my head and like the one of the kid full body leaning against trying to push open the door for some school of the gifted and right on the door, it says pull. And it's just, and he's pushing. It, was, it was just such a simple cartoon, but so damn funny. And I still think of that to this day. Like when someone does something dumb, I'll just imagine in my head, like pushing on that door, <laughs> you know, just willing it to open <laughs> at the school of the gifted. Um, and then the other <laughs> one, we talked about it a little bit with these un authorized tributes to Calvin and Hobbes, but people I think wanted Calvin and Hobbes to be somewhere like they're looking for it everywhere. And one cartoon that's okay. It's not great. Is Fraz uh, by Jeff Mallet. And I think the character main character is Fraz and he's yeah. a janitor to school. And the rumors are that, you know, that's Calvin when he's a little bit older I don't think it fits, but it's kind of nice to think, you know, all the different ways we imagine how Calvin may have grown up. Um, and I read that one, you know, it wasn't one that I skipped, but and yeah, it was no, one of some pretty good stuff. I remember that one, uh, A, it, because, yeah, he drew, he drew Fraz like an adult Calvin, Calvin yeah. rather. He, uh, you know, he had kind of spiky hair and it easily could have been him. And then I also remember, because uh, that was around even when, when I was, you know, uh, living up in this area and, you know, a so-called adult, and I was still reading comic strips, of course, only because he would, Fraz was a bicycle rider too. Like there would always yes. be stuff about him riding in races or, you know, getting his ride in in the morning or that that kind of thing. And uh, I was identified with Fraz as a result. I mean, I think I so said we could keep going on and on. There were many that we read. I said, there's new ones today. And I enjoy reading the new ones today, but it, you know, and I, I know I'm going to sound like an old man talking about the old days, but uh, there's no replacing that experience. Um, it's not quite the same to go on the internet and look it up yeah. and find it. Yeah, uh, I mean, that's you're absolutely right, because I stopped reading comic strips when I stopped subscribing to the Chicago Tribune, which I did for yeah. years. And finally, it just kept getting thinner and thinner. And I realized I was I was looking at everything on my, you know, I'd fire up the computer in the morning at work and I would just read the newspaper headlines there. So I stopped subscribing. And the thing I probably missed the most, maybe the only thing I really miss about having a, a, an actual newspaper is opening it up and reading the comics. And you're right, you have to search a little bit more. And, and I know that there are some sites that collect them all. Um, but like you said, it just doesn't quite seem the same. And uh, even the, the web comics that I do enjoy, I wait until they come out in print. And, I, and like you said, that just shows how old I am. But I, I wait for the hardcover or the, the Kickstarter that these uh, creators put together so they can put out a bound edition of their work. And then I spend a little money and get those. Uh, any questions from listeners this week? Indeed, there is. We have a question from Jonathan writing in from French Lick, Indiana. And I have been to French Lick, Indiana. And I'm not sure if I know this, Jonathan, though. His question is, other than Calvin and Hobbes, which is an easy one for you and me, yeah. what is your favorite comic strip of all time? Boy, it's tough after Calvin. Um, what uh, What is your response to this question? Well, I've sort of given it away already. I... I'm going with uh, Pearls Before Swine. It's um, it's irreverent. Um, and then there are moments where, like, so you get, for those who haven't read it, it's got main, two main characters, Rat um, and Pig. And Rat's just a scumbag and <laughs> screws over Pig every chance he gets. He's just a classic asshole. Um, and then Pig is this sweethearted, you know, loving just wants to make everyone happy and doesn't seem to mind that Rat constantly fucks him over. The author will show himself quite a bit. And there's a bunch of other characters that are equally funny, but those are the two main ones. And I think what I like about it, I talked about it, it, it shows uh, reverence for those comics that came before him. He uh, seems to be one of the more collaborative and he jokes about like when he makes fun of other comics. But even I, I just saw one online, I think it was yesterday or the day before, and it was Pig talking to some guy whose wife had obviously died and 
Um, Pig is just telling him, you know, do you think about this? Do you think about that? And he's standing next to the gravesite. And then at the end, it's Pig hugging this poor guy who's just lost huh. his wife. And there's a sweetness to it. And it's not overly sappy. And he doesn't do that stuff much. But the ones that really get me is every once in a while when Rat is a real person, like he, not a real person, but shows some either empathy or something. It doesn't happen much. And he'll usually wipe it away in the next panel with, you know, fuck you or you know, whatever. But <laughs> you'll have his moments where you can tell he's not totally evil. Um, and I just, you start to associate with the characters, even though they're just named Rat and Pig. Um, <laughs> easily, easily my favorite. And it's one that I would buy the collections um, as soon as they came out and still have a stack of them in my closet and like you said you talked about those are the things that i hold on to i've thrown away books or given away books but i've never given away my comic collections yeah yeah i, I haven't either well mine is also fairly predictable um but if i'm not allowed to say calvin and Hobbes, then i have to go with the far side by gary larson yeah uh, that one it it definitely it reflected, I feel like he he's one of those guys who invented irony back when we were that age. You know, there was there was Stephen Wright, the stand-up comic. There was, um, oh, and the other one is Jack Handy, who was uh, became famous, I think, uh, on Saturday Night Live back in that time period with his Deep Thoughts segment, which was also kind of, an, a, kind of like the far side, very much a micro version of of storytelling, very ironic uh, little jokes that were practically just one-liners, which is how I view uh, Farsight as well. He very seldom had a clunker. You know, they were they were generally single panel comics and they were every day of the week, there was a Farsight for a while. And it, you know, kind of explains why this guy, you know, why cartoonists have to retire eventually. Cause I don't know how you could just keep cranking out these really funny, almost always very ironic uh, strips. But he was, you know, along with Calvin and Hobbes, those were the two that I that I had to read every single day. They were the ones I bought collections of, of The Far Side before I bought any other comic strips collections or got any, you know, as gifts. And those are the ones that I always hold on to. And uh, he, uh, he really just seemed to kind of capture that period of time, the eighties and early nineties to me, or at least the humor of that period of time. And, you know, these days that might not be considered a good thing because now there's nothing but irony everywhere you look, but at the time it was, it really felt groundbreaking to, to, to see someone come up with these just oddball takes on uh, human behavior on a regular basis. Yep. I agree. And um, I have a early post facto, I talked about Pearls Before Swine and never mentioned the author's name. It's Stephen Pastis or Pastis. That's probably why I didn't say it because I was afraid I'd mispronounce it. <laughs> um, but it's funny you talk about uh, The Far Side because unless I'm making this up, I, I think I uh, would generally steal your, not steal, but uh, read the collections. I mean, they were around the apartments we lived in and uh, they were just great. Like you said, just quality humor panel after panel, page after page. They were just always sitting around our apartments. And I think, I'm not saying you introduced me to the far side, but you were definitely more into it at the time than I was. I mean, I was always into the comics, but um, I think you and I just sort of, when we came together, the merging of our love for comic strips took both of us to that next level because it's just had a huge impact on my life, uh, which is either sad or cool. I don't know. You decide. <laughs> It is what it is. <laughs> it is what it is, motherfucker. <laughs> why? Why did I have to say motherfucker? That would not have been like totally blipped out in the comics. But yeah, I just you saw, know. you know, Deathpool. He cursed a lot. Yes, so, they said. Uh, I remember there's a stat that says in MCU movie because it's technically that's an MCU movie. The the first two were not, uh, but now they're everything is linked together because you know Marvel and Disney have bought everything. Uh, they said in, in MCU movies, there are 145 instances of uh, use of the word fuck, and 144 of them are in that movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it was a great movie. I enjoyed it a lot. I'm telling you. I don't no, I did too. I, I stopped going to some of those uh, or to those movies for a while, and I'm going to go back. I've not seen any of the other Deadpool ones, which is kind of embarrassing. Yeah, they're equally as funny, and, and it's just Ryan Reynolds just 
you know, that he was born to play that character. He's just really good at it. All right, uh, let's do recommendations. Uh, as a reminder to our audience, this these recommendations are roughly then. Uh, we used to do a then and a now. Um, and we're now trying to keep it a little closer to then, which would have been college years or shortly thereafter. And when I use the word shortly, I, I do air quotes because I'm my recommendations 20 years after we were in college, but I don't care. Yeah, I think this time around, we both seem to have, uh, have departed a bit. But I think it's because, although these things came out in the early 2000s, uh, they're, you know, they're about stuff that actually came out in the 80s and 90s, so, or at least yes. mine is. And I think yours is, um, although I'm not sure about that because I'm not familiar with yours. Why don't you tell us about well, yours? You should be, man. It's funny. I stuck to the theme completely, and this has been a great episode for me to prep for because I've gone back and looked at all these old books that I had. And one that I had is a strip. I don't remember ever seeing it in the comics, in the in the papers, called Brevity. And it's very clearly, at a minimum, an homage to the far side, but you could be a little more cynical and say it's a copy of it. But it was... <laughs> It was a quality copy because, I mean, it's tough to try to follow in those footsteps. And I found that this guy, um, it's actually two guys, I believe. There's four books, four volumes that came out. Um, I'm recommending the first one. I would encourage folks to listen to um, any of them, listen to, read any of them. Uh, but it's it's how often I recommend music, obviously. So the first one's called Brevity, a collection of comics by Guy and Rod, R-O-D-D. -D. Um, it was first, it was published in 2006. And as I said, there's three follow versions. I posted on our script one, just sort of highlights the humor. It shows a truck on the side, it says Sheep Census Bureau. And it shows five sheep in a field. And it shows a guy sound asleep on his feet. with The idea that he's counting sheep. So he mm -hmm. fell asleep. So was this was this a newspaper comic strip? I don't know if it was. I never saw it. I um how did you I come across it? I think it's just what I was constantly looking on Amazon. I was shopping all the way back then because it was um it was a couple decades ago I bought this, or at least more than a decade. Uh I think I just did searches for like comic strips like either oh. Far Side or Calvin and Hobbes, and there's others that I came across. There's one called Argyle sweater, uh, which I thought was pretty funny. I can't remember, but brevity is the one that I, I bought all four books. I, so I'd read mm -hmm. one and be like, oh, it's pretty good. It's right. You get another one. So I bought all four and you know, it's, it's not, you know, earth shattering. And again, I think we've talked about some of those that change the industry, Calvin and Hobbes for sure, far side. Um, but to, like I said, to have the guts to try to write something that's very clearly reminiscent of far side, you still have to be funny. And I thought that he oh, was yeah. like, uh, one of the other ones he pulled up, it just shows Yogi Bear. It's like, after all the scores were tabulated, Yogi would be ashamed to discover that he wasn't actually smarter than the average bear, that he was in fact stupider and by quite a large margin. <laughs> it's just like, it's not terribly funny, but it, it made me laugh. So yeah, I, I would recommend Brevity, the comic strip. And there's four volumes that I would encourage you to check out, starting with the one in 2006. What you got, Tom? I am recommending a book about Bill Watterson uh, and Calvin and Hobbes. And, uh, the book is titled Looking for Calvin and Hobbes, uh, written by a guy named Nevin Martell. came out in 2009. Uh, it is a pretty comprehensive biography of Watterson and the, the strip itself. It talks a lot about Watterson's uh, retirement from public life and his retirement from being a cartoonist at all. It, it, it talks a lot about the fact that he never did license his, you know, any of his intellectual property, which of course means that you get to see Calvin, you know, on the back of all kinds of pickup trucks, pick, you know, pissing on whatever that person seems to dislike. And that always irritated me, but it's an interesting study of, uh, Watterson as an artist and how, you know, frankly, he just didn't care about that stuff. He just wanted to create his comic strip and he wasn't interested in, you know, making a million dollars or turning it into a, an animated feature. He was approached by, you know, hundreds of people probably over the years 
to do just that. And he just, that's why he didn't want to do it. Um, or that's why he didn't do it was because he didn't want to get involved in that part of it. You know, whereas most of these uh, comic artists, at least, you know, after, after the two thousands, you know, they were always angling to see if there was another way to make money off of their characters. And, you know, it's justified. They created cool stuff, but he just wasn't into it. And uh, the book does a good job of looking into this guy's character and his kind of his psychology. I enjoyed it. I would give it a four out of five egg burritos with sour cream as my recommendation. And uh, I think you would like it actually, because I know how much you love Callan. I am going to check it out. But first, I'm going to give my collection of comics four out of five also. Well, you you know, you posted that it's funny to me that I never had even come across brevity. That's why I was wondering if it was a newspaper strip or maybe it was a, uh, you know, a web comic. I uh, you you put on our outline, you just cut and pasted a, one of the strips. It's the Sheep Census Bureau one. It's yeah. hilarious. I really think it's funny. Uh, and we should consider maybe putting that up on our uh, as mentioned page so people can get a look at it. Maybe more okay. people know about it than I realized, but I had never even heard of it. And I couldn't remember the name of it. I, like I said, I had to go back because um, my books are up in the attic. I didn't feel like climbing to the attic in a 96 degree weather in freaking North Carolina. So, yeah, no, I, that seems fair. We are now ready for post facto. It's a mistake. It's a mistake. Where Tom admits his mistakes and I laugh at him for it. But no, it's where we either complete thoughts, because I often have all these thoughts running around in my head and then I just say something and there's zero context for it. Um, or we make flat out mistakes or we just decide that, hey, that'd be an interesting thing to add, um, which we also will do with blogs now where we have post the post facto series that Tom is becoming famous for. So what mistakes do you have this week, Thomas? Am, am I really becoming famous for those? I'm not sure that's true. <laughs> My post facto entry, there is only one this week, and it relates to uh, my interview of my dad on this on our uh, very, very, very long driving trip from Phoenix to Joliet, Illinois. Uh, I uh, at one point we were talking about video games and my dad's status at the time as an early adopter of technology, and it was kind of cool because he would buy we would get video games and, and cool stuff like that before a lot of my friends, just because my dad wanted to play. Uh, but it was really weird. We could not think I, uh, of the name of the first console uh, game we got after we, <laughs> my dad bought a pong and bought some crazy video uh, pinball game that lasted about two weeks, but it was Atari. And I, I, at that point, I think Atari was about the only game console out there, but I said something about it being Netflix or Netflix, uh, Nintendo. And he, was sure it wasn't Nintendo, but couldn't remember the name. But of course it was Atari. And uh, I feel like Atari in the early 80s deserves a shout out because they were, they made the best games and uh, certainly just about the only console you could play. So that's my post facto for this episode. And that's funny because I was uh, listening uh, and I was like, Atari. Yeah. And it was, it was in my head. I mean, again, it's harder when you're in the moment because your your brain freezes up. Yes, and, uh, we, we may have been driving through a sandstorm at that point, so that's, <laughs> that's going to be my excuse. Yeah, I don't think the name of a 1980s video game system was the most important thing in your mind right then. So. Not as I was dodging a, a cow flying through the air in front of me. <laughs> we are now ready for Staff Picks. Ran now, just around the corner from you. Uh, Chris and I are each going to recommend something that's relatively new in pop culture. And we're going to tell you, go take a look at this. What's your pick, Chris? What do you pick that is out or coming out that you're interested in? So I pick something that is um, totally not my style. Um, I was driving yesterday and there was a new release thing on my Android audio, Auto. I clicked it and this hit shuffle. And it played a song by a band called Towers. T-O-W apostrophe R-S. It's a husband, wife duo. There's more members. Um, but they sing together through almost all the songs that came up. Uh, the album is called Versions. And the opening track, which is the one that I like the most, um, is called Swelling Sea. 
and it's all about love. And I went online and looked them up. They're out of Flagstaff, Arizona. I think they might sing some religious stuff as well. They're very wholesome. Uh, her voice is beautiful. His voice didn't stand out as much to me. It's not a bad voice, but it didn't have any of the edge or anything else that I usually like. Um, but I still really, really like this song. And I listened, uh, I kept listening. I listened to six or seven songs in a row. Um, and I think it holds up. It's a pretty solid album. There's a little bit that reminded me of the Everybody Fields uh, with their harmonizing. What I ended up liking a little bit more is that the woman's voice dominated her husband's. Um, his, as I said, sort of took a back seat. He didn't have a bad voice at all, but it wasn't uh, some of that disharmony that I usually like between voices. But I thought the album was very solid and um, her voice especially carried the weight. That first song, uh, Swelling Sea, is a really, really good song. So that's my pick. Uh, iTunes says traditional folk. Uh, would you yeah. agree with that? Yeah, I would. I mean, another article compared them to, I think there's a band called the National Parks um, mm -hmm. and then the Lumineers. Uh, but okay, it's definitely more pop. Gotcha. Um, but, I, you know, I like to hear new stuff and that's what this is all about. And this is something I wouldn't usually listen to. So hopefully somebody out there will like it just as much as I did. Cool. Cool. My staff pick for this episode is a film uh, that is currently streaming on Netflix, directed by David Fincher, called The Killer. Uh, it stars Michael Fassbender, who uh, we were talking about X-Men movies earlier. He was Magneto in uh, Mac, uh, a bunch of X-Men movies, as, as well as playing a lot of other good roles. He's a really good actor. It, this, it, I watched this film on the plane to Phoenix, and really, really liked it. Liked it to the extent that I want to watch it again at home with surround sound because it's actually a very quiet movie, especially the first probably hour of it is really just following Michael Fassbender, who's playing this assassin who, you know, it's kind of a cliche at this point, but he has a he has a job go wrong. And the rest of the movie is about the ramifications of that and how he has to deal with it. But most of the beginning of the movie, and really most of the movie in general, is is kind of his voiceover uh, without a whole lot of dialogue between people. And I think it would be better without all the plane noise. It was hard, you know, I had headphones on and it just wasn't, it, I really, really liked it. And I think I would enjoy it even more if I'm in a, in a situation where I can hear all the sound because I think there were a lot of quiet things that were going on. I, it seems like the sound design, which is not something I usually pay a lot of attention to, was really good on this. And uh, Fastbender is really interesting in this role. There's a great cameo towards the end of the movie by Tilda Swinson. I won't spoil it by saying what happened, but there is a at a restaurant across from the table scene, kind of like Heat with uh, De Niro and uh, uh, Al Pacino. And it's it's just really cool. It's a very cool movie, kind of oddly kind of a quiet movie considering it's about you know, professional killers. The soundtrack has the Smiths all over it. And I'm not a big Smiths fan, but it's perfect for this movie. And I recommend it highly. It's called The Killer. It's streaming on Netflix. And you should uh, watch it as soon as you can. Yeah, you know that's not going to happen. I don't ever watch movies. It's not prestige TV, man. Just fucking go watch the movie. I watched a movie. I'm done for like six months. I saw it. <laughs> All right. Fair enough. Fair enough. I'll just tell you about it. I'll tell other people about it. Maybe they'll tell you to watch it. Maybe you'll listen to somebody if it's not me. I don't know. I don't think so now on to our playlist so tom and i each episode choose a song to add to an ongoing playlist we have one for each of our seasons we're now on season four these playlists will appear on spotify youtube music amazon music and apple music tom what's your choice for this week this week i am choosing the song 10 second news by sun volt that's from their album trace uh, which came out in 1995. What a great album. Love this album. Uh, 10 Second News is not usually a song I recommend from the album, but it felt right for a an episode about comic strips. Uh, it's uh, I don't think that's what this song is about, but I, I felt like, yeah, you know, each each comic strip, a few seconds each time, and you, will, you move your way through the newspaper. So it's a tenuous connection, but it's the best I could do. And great fucking song. 
Uh, you want tenuous? I'll give you tenuous. <laughs> <laughs> so my song is uh, this also a great song. Short, two minutes, 22 seconds. Song by Morphine, one of my favorite bands, as you know. The song is Sharks from their Yes album uh, from 1995, which is a great album. Sharks isn't actually, it wasn't originally one of my favorite songs. Uh, it's more of a spoken word one. Um, but the connection is, is one of the comics that I did not skip and actually kind of liked, even though it was a little shallow, uh, was one called Sherman's Lagoon, which was about a shark and his overbearing wife, uh, it had its moments of humor. So sharks and Sherman's Lagoon, get it? Got it. Yeah, actually, uh, we both just barely, uh, hung onto the theme there, I would say. But it works out. I like it. I, I also like that song. And uh, those songs, both of those songs, by the time you hear this episode, they will already be on Third Song in Season 4, which is a companion playlist to this uh, season's worth of podcast episodes. And as Chris said, you can find them wherever you stream your music. Well, that's the end of this episode of Third Song In. Third Song In is recorded in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, in Joliet, Illinois. You can email us at thirdsongin at gmail.com. You can find our website at thirdsonginpodcast.com, where we have um, our blog. Our recommendations are listed there. Our staff picks. There's an episode spotlight. Uh, we would like you to follow us wherever you do listen to your podcasts. Or please rate and review us. Give us all your stars. You can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, and YouTube Music which is also where you can find our playlist. We have companion playlists for each season of this uh, of Third Song In, uh, and it, they are you can search for them on the same streaming services under Third Song In, Season 1, Season 2, etc. Uh, we are also trying to include uh, polls on our Spotify feed for the podcast, so you can uh, weigh in on what you think are the best recommendations or staff picks, etc. You've been listening to Third Song In with Chris Derrickson and Tom Polachek. Thanks for listening. But you can't record a middle finger, my friend. And I just gave you two of them. Right here. Right there. Two fucking middle fingers. Do some work. I'll be, right, I'll be there in a second. What the fuck are you doing? None of your damn business. <laughs> All right. Well... I was like, what's Jeffy fucking with now? <laughs> <laughs>